Curtis? Mrs. Boone? Yes. Mrs. Halso? Here. Mr. Kunko? Yes. Mr. McGinnis? Here. Mr. Hose? Mr. Redmond? Here. Thank you. I need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Support. Moved and supported. Any discussion? I guess we uh, probably could eliminate the Pledge of Allegiance since we skipped it. Um, any further discussion? All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. Agenda is approved. At this time, we have an opportunity for comments from the public. We will have an additional opportunity later in the meeting. At this time, we can move on to uh, review committee meeting items. Okay, thank you, Mr. Redman. All right, if you want to uh, take a look at your uh, rubric from the for the uh, committee meeting items under curriculum, I will not be giving you an update on the COVID extended learning plan until the board meeting because I have to give you the numbers of students. Uh, with the one way and two way. So that will, will happen next week. All right, at this time we have two updates. Um, one from middle school, high school from Tim Hanel because he's going to talk about the semester high school grades and exams. That's going to be an action item for, for the board meeting next uh, week. And Tyler uh, Hamilton, our elementary principal, will be giving us an update on uh, report cards and what's happening there in the elementary. So I believe that you have a handout in your packet that um, I can show you here. It says Lake City Middle and High School. Tim has written a number of things here. If you have that available, take a minute and pull that out because he is going to go through a number of those things with you. Okay, Dr. Hanel. Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see y'all. Uh, just walking through again, I'm not going to belabor each of these issues, but they are, they are pretty big things. So the, the first one, we've had a lot of question regarding grades, uh, thinking back to the second semester last year, and particularly, we know that grades are important, but they're really important in high school because they lead to credits, right? Credits lead to graduation. So with that thought in mind, at the end of last year, uh, we gave everyone credit in all classes. So regardless of ability or regardless of um, how much they were able to connect or turn in packet work, we, we went along with the state and we gave everyone credit for their courses. And, and that was a good thing. Uh, we didn't want to add to the additional stress at the time entry, entering into a pandemic. So that's where we landed. With this semester though, uh, we, we need to make that more rigid, right? We need to not give kids grades. We built in flexibility and grace into our normal every day truly throughout the course of this uh, semester. But what we've looked at is this, um, semester grades have been weighted. And what I mean by that, and you know this, is that the, the total semester grade is the one that determines grade point average and that moving up or down. And the two, the three pieces of that semester grade are marking period one grade, marking period two grade, and then the final exam for that semester. Those three are added up and an average is given as the final exam or the final semester grade that affects the grade point average. The waiting for that has been the, the semester exam has always been 15%. Okay, 
okay, which leaves 85%. That divided by two is 42.5. So marking period one grade has been 42.5% of the semester grade, marking period two grade, another 42.5, and then the exam has been 15. Uh, we are not doing exams. That's very consistent with what top schools are doing around the country, honestly. And there's a number of variables for that. Um, so we are not doing exams in terms of waiting, okay, for this semester, this semester's grade. There are a number of classes that are still giving exams, though, because we still believe that it's a nice <laughs> cumulative uh, measure of, of what a student got out of the learning for that semester. So we are still giving some exams, but the waiting will not play a factor in the, in the semester grade. What we are going to propose is that for, for this current school year, the semester one final grade um, has a reflective waiting for marking periods one and marking period two, okay? And really what we've looked at is the amount of face-to-face of -face meetings, whether they were in person or face-to-face -face on um, our, our virtual uh, classes. For first semester, or first marking period, we had 42 days where we were able to be in person, okay? And second marking period, we, had, we will have 21 days that were uh, in person. And that is really speaking about the high school because we only have two days a week that high school is face-to-face -face virtually. The other days they're, they're doing the work but not meeting face-to-face, uh, -face, right? So when we look at those proportions, it makes sense to us knowing that the teacher is the number one decision maker in student learning and truly is able to motivate kids where they need to be um, and have them do what they need to do. So what we're proposing is that uh, the final grade for the semester is made up of 70% of the uh, first marking period grade and then 30% of the second marking period, okay? And what we did was we looked at, and I can send you this, the Excel spreadsheet if you're interested in numbers and tables to really see how this sorted out, but initially when we looked at this, it, it was to, to, to benefit students, right? Because we don't want students to fail. We want what we provided to students to really resemble a good learning experience. And if everyone fails what we've provided, then that means that that's not a good uh, indicator. So what we, in, in addition to that, when students do fail cl classes, they need to make those classes up either the next semester or the following year. And that takes seats and classes for incoming freshmen or it's credit recovery courses and so on, right? So we looked at what percentages, we looked at 50-50, marking period one, 50%, marking period two, we looked at 60-40, we looked at 70-30 and looked at 75-25. And 70-30 really gave us the best mixture in terms of, um, there still will be plenty of students that will fail courses, unfortunately. Um, and we are working with them individually to try to help them uh, with that. But that makeup uh, is what we believe to be the best, okay? So I, I, I also just indicate on this, uh, this information sheet that for semester two grades, we're, we're being mindful as we enter into semester two. No decisions have been made, obviously. We're hoping to have a whole semester of in-person for those that are able to do that or, or choosing that. Uh, but we are going to continue to assess throughout, okay? I know that soon as we enter second semester, kids and parents uh, will ask you and us, are we going to have second semester exams in four, five, five and a half months? Well, we don't know yet, right? But uh, I do want you to know that we're being thoughtful about that. So any questions about the semester one grades? <clears throat> Uh, pieces of that. Okay. The next uh, order that we have on an academic update is credits needed for graduation. And it, and it really is, is kind of this simple, right? The current seniors have had an opportunity to gain seven full credits each year because they've had seven periods throughout the course of their day. 
So freshman year, seven. If they earn seven more their sophomore year, that's 14. Seven more their junior year, that's 21. And then they have an opportunity really to gain another seven um, traditionally their senior year, which allows students to take a variety of courses. What we have did, what we did last year was students were not penalized at all um, because of the pandemic last year. If anything, it helped a lot of students because we gave them credit for their courses, right? Uh, so last year doesn't really have a bearing, but this year does. And it does because we always have about 10 to 12 seniors that we are, are pushing and motivating and dragging at times across the finish line. Uh, to finish up, okay, and not being with us for the last number of weeks and having the learning pieces be a bit disjointed throughout the course of this first semester, my fear is that we will have six to eight students that um, will not be able to graduate simply because we went to six periods this current year, okay, that's an important piece. Um, at the beginning of this year, our schedule, we went to six periods instead of seven, so kids don't have that extra course. And if kids came into this year needing that extra hour or that extra class to make up a, a credit for graduation, they didn't. They started out not being able to have that as an opportunity. Okay, so I just want that on your radar. Truly, um, we do have a lesser, not lesser, but we have a Michigan merit diploma that students can earn which is an 18 credit diploma which you have approved some students uh, for reception of that in the in the past couple of years kids who have dug a hole they need a, a path to graduation that's different than tradition and it is noted on the bottom of their diploma it says michigan merit diploma okay so i'm not proposing that these students shift all the way down to to that though that fewer credit diploma what i'm suggesting is is if we have a few students that um, will need that extra that, that would have benefited from that extra class that they would have been able to take if we wouldn't have shifted to six periods from seven then i may ask you to consider for the class of 2021 um, the graduation requirement instead of 23 credits for a traditional diploma having it be 22 okay but i will run those numbers really at the end of next week and then i'll talk to kim i don't think you would need to move on anything i just want it on your radar in case i bring it to you again um, so that you have an understanding so any questions about that Okay, awesome. And then moving forward with the current uh, high school classes that are that have been involved in this, right? So incoming freshmen, they've never had a year with seven class periods. So they will actually, if we keep six periods all through their high school career, they would have an opportunity to learn earn four less credits um, throughout the course of their high school. I don't know that we'll do that, just so you know. Uh, it, it really will depend upon what how things look if it looks like we would be able to get through next school year without needing to go remote then we probably would bump back to seven periods because then that would help kids that need to make up credits plus it would also help students who want extra opportunities and we want that for them so we will push back to seven as soon as we can but six works a lot better when we're remote it, being on the same schedule as the middle school really that congruence um, is a very important thing. So I have this as a bullet item because in the future, I, you know, depending upon if we go stay with six or shift to back to seven, um, that would have a bearing on the cumulative amount of credits needed for graduation down the road. So that'll just be a, a flexible piece that we'll keep talking about. The next bullet piece is a discussion about top scholars replacing valedictorian and salutatorian recognition. Um, that's a big deal, right? Like raise your hand if you're, you don't, not really, but if salutatorian of your class, your valedictorian, like people aim for that. And um, some people don't, right? Some people don't really care, but those that do care, do care. And we have witnessed with you sitting alongside me, we've witnessed a, a lot of amazing speeches in the last number of years. Uh, what what top scholars are, and, and Cadillac does this, McBain does this, a number of schools 
locally do and a number of schools around the country do. And this isn't the first time we've talked about this, but I'm going to tell you why it may make more sense at this time. And I'm not proposing it for class of 2021. For this current graduating class, I'm not proposing it for that, but I would propose it for the, um, the next, next year, class of 22 uh, moving forward. What that does is it allows us to choose a percentage of our class, and typically it's a top 5%, okay? And we've had that, if you really think. The last few years we've had, there was a year we had, I think, six valedictorians. Uh, last year we had three or four. The year prior to that we had multiples. So if you look at our top scholars, truly, over the course of the last six years, it has been uh, four to seven kids that have risen to the top of the class. What this top scholar, and, and we've talked with um, admissions counselors and admissions folks from a lot of the colleges that our students get into, uh, their grade point averages right now don't, don't really matter in terms of when, when they get to an admissions office. And what I mean by that is ad admission offices take our current GPAs that we configure here at the local level and they put it into a separate algorithm that works nationwide, okay? So kids coming from California, Michigan, wherever, they have a separate equation that they use. So that's already happening. There is scholarship money out there though for valedictorians and top scholars. And what this would allow truly is for more students to receive some of that financial assistance. And that would just be an added bonus that I included here. Um, a couple of the other pieces that uh, there's been times where class ranking, wanting that you have a really solid freshman year, you want to hold on to your four point. So you might not take as challenging of classes your junior or senior year because you want to retain that. So you can either get financial assistance or you can be a valedictorian or sutorian or whatever, right? We've, I've seen that gaming firsthand uh, most years and it, it's disappointing because I want kids to continue to challenge themselves um, so it would eliminate that if we move to this. And that would just be an extra benefit. One of the reasons I think it's pretty timely is right now we have anywhere from 20 to 28% of some of our, our classes that are choosing remote education or virtual education, okay? And I want for our virtual chemistry to be the exact same as our in-person chemistry. I want it to be apples to apples on a transcript, right? But it's just not yet, right? Like we did, we have had our teachers vet all of the curriculum and most of the modules for all of our virtuals. So it is closer than, than a lot of schools are, but I want to continue to refine that so that we know that a virtual student's education really is reflective of what's happening down the hallway here. And that if a kid stands up top of their class next year, year before, whether they were in person or virtual, right? It's, it's the same. Um, there will always be a bit of a difference, right? But we just want to trim that down. So I think it's timely because as these pandemic cohorts move through, you know, we may have that. We may have where kids are online because it's easier, whether it is or not, and they're moving through courses and they're getting four points and kids that are here in person, right? There's a lot of factors there. They might be involved in more extracurricular and blah, blah, blah. So with that disparity among it's it's not the same experience for every kid pushing through i want to consider how that will impact class ranking and if, if top scholars might be a better fit um, to recognize those students at the top right and that's truly what it's about is is the recognition uh, for those students so again that's a big piece right that's like taking away the, the Easter Bunny or something from Americana High School, and I understand that, but but I think that some decisions like that make really good sense. So, any any questions about that piece? Yes, Tim. This is Craig. Yes, please. Um, I have a question on how does how does you know? I think two years ago we went through the waiting process in the advanced course or um, advanced placement classes. How does that play into this? And uh, I thought that would take care of some of those issues of game, the gaming that went on. Yes, so we will see that reflected uh, next year. So next year will be the first weighted group that moves through. 
And that definitely would. Uh, that definitely would. I. The challenge for me is to. I don't know if it will take care of all of them now that we have such a percentage of our students that are taking virtual courses and the other part that are taking in person. And I'm I'm trying to just make sure that that there's a level playing field yeah, there. And then and then, then the other thing is, you know, I understand the virtual, but uh, I'm hoping that's gonna go away. For sure. And so for sure. I think we need to plan for that. Um, that is that that will go away to make sure we're we're making changes for the future. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Um, and then the next bullet down on, uh, nope, that we did, I just addressed that. Um, but the weighted classes will play into this next year, right? It will, yeah, for sure. Okay. So really, help me understand, are, is this really uh, semantics? Or are we impacting students? Then there is a financial gain that could go to some students being a top scholar because if I, if Central Michigan knows I'm a top scholar, then in their language, that's a valedictorian, salutatorian position, whether I'm top two or number five um, at our in our place, right? So, so that would be an added bonus there for kids. A lot so that would be, of that would be a piece. Yeah, Joe. Well, college has got rid of the scholarships for just vals and sales, Craig. So okay. I think the top scholar, I've been an advocate for this for 15 years, and I think it will help more of our kids get some more money at the college level. Okay, well, just for your information, I was number six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there are only five students in your class. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> And then I just want to point out how great your class was. So number six is like number one every other year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Tyler. We're going to call you. We're going to, well, never mind. <laughs> so we will revisit this. Um, I just really wanted to put, put it in front of you and would welcome any further conversation. Um, okay. Any of you. Moving into, and then again, I'll wrap up these pieces. Um, athletic update. I have winter athletic protocols and expectations. We know that uh, right now we are going with, I believe the December 8 um, guidelines mm -hmm. that have been put out by MDHHS and that's what MHSA is basing their pieces off. They are getting some additional guidance from um, the MDHHS, MHSAA is, and they are trying to garner some pieces ahead of uh, any possible announcements this coming Thursday or whenever the, the next round of, of those updated uh, policies come out. But currently looking at what's been taking place with uh, the finishing of the, of the um, fall seasons for football and volleyball and, and so on, um, we are believing that uh, there, there are most likely not going to be any spectators that are able to um, come into the, the the athletic contest that we hold. We met as a Highland Conference last week to adjust all of our schedules. We're going to be playing, it looks like 13 to 14 games, um, not getting our 20 game season in, which I think is going to be okay. Um, I think it's a long season anyway, right? Uh, 20 games is a, is a long season, but but it allows us an opportunity. So so with that, we obviously will have all the same protocols we had in place. Now today, MHSAA did get permission for the, the finals in football and volleyball. They did get permission for 125 people uh, for each team outdoors. And then I believe 50 people each team indoors. I don't know if that will happen or not leading into a you know a regular season of sorts. Um, I think that was probably a special arrangement that they leveraged just to try to uh, to get people in front watching their kids for these final games, but I'm not sure. So I'll just remain in conversation with you all regarding that. Um, as a conference, we all did vote with uh, actually with encouragement from our Cadillac Area Officials Association president 
we voted to have only officials that are going to follow the, the facial covering um, requirement, right? There were a band of officials that were just saying we have medical reasons to not do this and whether they actually did or not, I, I, that's a pretty gross uh, thing for me to say, but whether they did or not. So we were asked to pass a resolution that stated the Highland Conference only wants officials that are willing to uh, to uphold this. Reason being, you know, if Brian can't come and watch Darren play basketball and he's watching the game via a live stream and he sees an official running up and down a court without a mask on and he can't even be in the building, right? You know what I mean? There, there's just a lot of variables there that we don't we don't want to deal with and don't don't need to deal with. So. That's one of the pieces there. Uh, with that said, we, we uh, in partnership with the Athletic Boosters, just so you know, if parents are not allowed in, or even if they are, but a, a smaller amount. For volleyball, we had a live stream, and that worked pretty well. Um, for basketball, we, we were able to purchase really a state-of-the-art camera um, so we'll be able to pan with the action on the court. Volleyball, that's a little harder because you're moving all over. Um, but it will be a, a really a fantastic picture and an updated score on, on the screen as well. So we're appreciative of the boosters helping us uh, get that as of, as of a couple of days ago. So Am I going to need to, Tim, this is Craig. Yeah. Yes, Am please. Am I going to need to get a new computer so I can watch this fancy camera? You won't. No, it, it does actually, it will uh, provide video in 4K, which is uh, a pretty big deal for people that care about that. <laughs> yeah, we, Brian has an extra TV you could use. Okay, thanks. If you need, he'll hook you up. The, uh, the winter athletic schedules, just so you know, I mentioned 13 to 14 games for JV varsity in both sports. And assuming everything stays on track, and we can begin practices next Saturday, the 16th, which is weird, um, instead of that Monday, the 18th. I would consider allowing not like all day practices next weekend <laughs> in two weekends, but I would allow brief practices simply because the contests are going to begin on the 22nd that Friday. So for some of these teams, they will need to do tryouts and cuts Monday, <laughs> Tuesday, uh, then they'll be able to practice Wednesday, Thursday, and have a game on Friday. Um, I know that that's short. The conversation I had with the coaches is, you know, if anyone comes out killing it, then they've been practicing behind closed doors and they're cheaters and cheaters uh, never win. So we should be okay there. But uh, it, it'll be nice to just get a game in and, and wear the uniform and do our best. So we're all moving forward with that. The middle school calendars what we are what we are going to do is uh, our middle school boys schedule was cut really short they only managed to get in four games i believe so we are going to have them start uh, as soon as we start school back up um, in person they will begin practice again we will get four more games in for the boys which will bring them to eight total typically they get in about 12 just for reference and then we would have uh, seven to eight girls games as well once that happens. So any questions about basketball and those schedules at all? Yeah, Tim, how often do you get updated on the no spectator? You know, it's it, it really is whenever MDHHS, when, when they have a big press conference with the, the governor, which I think is going to happen tomorrow, maybe, from what I'm being told, um, when those orders come out, then MHSAA right after comes out with their interpretation as to how those inside gatherings impact athletics. And then from there, I push those out. On my way here this evening, I actually saw the article on MLive saying that MHSAA was allowing spectators for um, the, the finals games. So that's how I got that information. <laughs> So it's just going to be hard on a lot of parents if they can't. Oh, you know, it'll be, it'll be crazy. It'll be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Truly. And we've, we've set what, what they, what MHSA has done in the past uh, is they have, they've set the acceptable personnel 
that way you don't have a video team of 14 right um, going to places and six people keeping scorebook and so on so we will set what those positions are and, and kind of do our best um, with that so but I'll, I'll keep you all posted on that and yeah that definitely would be a uh, one of the the, the big disappointments for sure. Thanks, the, Sam. Oh, sorry. Um, wrestling for this this current year, we earlier had talked about canceling the wrestling season. I just want to uh, confirm. I've I've had some conversations with wrestling parents and wrestling kids and so on. I still still do believe that wrestling is different than any other sport simply because of the the constant connectedness that kids have for that length of time and i, I think of all of the the sports that we have as and as opportunities for kids that um, that is is probably the most unsafe with that said there there are a number of districts that are rolling the dice on that and moving forward with wrestling um, and uh, we would be, and I'm good with this, we, we'd be in the minority in terms of making this decision in the best interest of kids. And, uh, and I am good with that. I just want to make sure that we're all, we're all still there. And then I also wanted to talk about uh, competitive cheer and your thoughts regarding that. Okay. Competitive cheer, we, we started uh, two seasons ago unofficially boosters purchased mats for us for the season last season girls attended some competitions and this year we were an officially sanctioned mhsaa sport um, sponsored team which was a, a big deal competitive is a little different and, and i'm not trying to sell it but i want us to have all the the important information if we were a competitive cheer team which we could be just looking at some of you there uh, we won't when we go to places it's just us like we don't interact closely with with cheerleaders or cheer teams from other schools like we would take the mat at a certain time we would do our routines we would exit the mat and other teams would so on right so the the contact and that would take place really would be among the girls on our team now there is lifting there is stunting there is that close contact which which i call sustained contact okay and i differentiate that because in basketball there's contact too there's not supposed to be right but there's intermittent contact not sustained where i'm holding tyler up above my head with you know whatever so those variances i just want us to to think about with that uh competitive cheer they typically will practice their routines for a month like a solid month and have them down before they even get to any sort of a, of a performance, right? Or an event. So, but I, I, we, we didn't land, I don't believe on what, what, what our thoughts were with regard to competitive. Um, I just want to know if I should offer that to, uh, to the, the coach and to the team with wrestling again i don't have an official varsity coach right i mean i i'm pretty good with that decision i just wanted to revisit it um, with competitive it's going to impact probably seven to eight girls last i knew um, if you're curious about that so questions about those items tim this is craig and yes i have a question help me understand competitive cheer i would think is a lot like wrestling as far as the contact so it, it would be only the, the only di well the, the main difference would be that they won't encounter people from other schools right it'll right? be our our girls truly yep just that cohort and in wrestling they will only encounter people from other schools so those would be the two the, two, two major differences yeah and then then the next question would be can we with our girls interacting together can we keep them safe with um you know social distancing which is, we can't but masks or whatever i mean how does that all play into this you know what i'm saying yeah they would be required to wear facial coverings yes the 
again, the, the challenge with like in our basketball practices, we are going to have kids stay six feet apart and we're going to ask coaches to do their best, even when you're talking through defenses and offenses and inbound plays, have kids distance, right? Mitigate that as best possible. Um, in, in the cheer, you're going to be practicing that with that closeness, which sure. that's the point that that would concern me from a from a risk standpoint. Well, it, I, I, it concerns me too. But they don't really sit with each other after competitions because I've been to a lot of them. They sit in their own little groups. My concern is, are they going to clean the mat in between each competition from the schools? Yeah, yes, they certainly would. Okay, then I feel they would be safe because they sit in their groups. You know, they're going to touch the eight kids, but I think it's more dangerous playing basketball than um, competition cheer. So I'm for the cheer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure the contact is the same as wrestling either. I'm trying to work through it in my head, but I mean, I, I can see where you could, you know, there'd be some similarities, but uh, I don't know. I guess I got mixed feelings on the chair. Is this something we need to do tonight or? We don't need to do it tonight. I just wanted us to be thoughtful about it. Um, okay. We, we, they would not begin anything until the, the 16th, potentially, which would be um, end of you know, that, a week from this coming Saturday. So. Well, we, we probably have until next week to do a final on that, guys. But I would, would like some feedback on that. We're going to make that call. We're, we're all going to be, you know, either for or again, we're going to need to make sure we're on the same page. So. And I, I think that's it. I do have a couple more items on the, the sheet regarding technology and how we're going to uh, gather that back from students when, when they return on the 18th. Uh, we do, we are fine tuning those systems. Uh, to get our hotspots um, and our Chromebooks back. And then students moving from in-person to virtual, we address that on this sheet as well. Um, Kim addressed that in her letter home uh, that was posted and that we'll send out as well. Just making sure parents understand because some people have had a good experience with remote. They like the way that it's taking place, but we want them to know that if they have liked that experience and want to continue virtually, they will shift to edge and Moody, and in the middle school will be with Doug Petrosky and Nick Johnson, and the high school will be with uh, with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Thome, and it will be a different experience, right? So that's one of the pieces we just really want people. So what I'm doing in those instances is Sarah Coleccio at the at the middle school and, and Jim Snyder at the high school are calling families to make sure they're choosing the right option. So. But that, that thanks for letting me talk so long. Um, again, any of these. Any questions or further conversation on any of these items, I'd, I'm available and, and would love a chance to uh, talk with anyone who has a question or concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, the next item under curriculum and um, is I want Tyler just to talk briefly about uh, the standards-based report card that we are developing and piloting in the elementary and really how that's very impactful when we're doing virtual and remote. So Tyler, I'm gonna let you go ahead and bring us up to date. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully I can keep this quick and concise uh, for you. But um, so before the pandemic hit, right, I'm sitting there and I like to have three-year plans, right? So I have all this stuff set up and in my three-year plan was by now we would have standard-based report cards uh, all set up in the elementary and uh, we would be, we'd be rolling on this. And then obviously pandemic hit and we had to kind of shift a little bit. And so, you know, we focused more on technology, our Google Classroom, everything else. But before that time, there was some 
grade levels that actually uh, latched on to this and kind of um, kind of created their their standard based report card. And the biggest thing for us now going forward is we might have a first grader that comes out of a class and he has all A's, right? We don't really know. We know that he did well on all the schoolwork and whatever that that teacher graded. But when the second grade teacher gets gets that report card, just based on that, we don't always know the specific skills that that student knows going to the next grade level. So that's why I think that standard based report cards are really important because that that will follow them all the way through. In unlike high school where there are credits for being able to you know go to college or for to graduate essentially. Um, through elementary school, we're trying to make sure that they know all of those standards all the way through. And this is a this is just a better, more efficient way of of tracking it. And especially with COVID, we know that there's going to be students with larger larger learning gaps and everything else. And it will be very beneficial for teachers um, in the future and for now to kind of know exactly what um, what the students know and what they don't know and at what level they're at um, moving forward. And so. We started in a few grade levels um, with these standard based report cards on a, and we've had Tara, Rachel, um, all the grade level teachers involved in creating this standard based report card. And then moving forward, instead of a parent getting a, you know, they in English, they have an A, um, they will be getting a report card that uh, spells out all the standards that we're covering and where they're at on that standard because um, that way, you know, if they if they're not good at blending, they know that they're great in these areas, but here's here's an area that they kind of need to work on. And so my push for this next half of the year is to develop that and move us forward with standards based. And so moving moving forward for years to come, um, we are we're a standard based report card instead of just our classic A, B and C's or one, two and threes, um, you know, kind of what traditional elementary report cards look like. Does that make sense? Sorry, I, that's that's pretty much all of my uh, stuff. I don't have a huge list like Tim, but if anyone does have any questions about standard-based report cards and how they're different or anything else, I, I would love to have a conversation. So just let me know. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, um, we're gonna move on to personnel. And um, I just wanted to let you know that we, we continue to track staff with the COVID concerns. Um, prior to Christmas, we had a number of staff. I think I had eight or nine staff um, who would have been either quarantine or positive, um, along with students who parents contacted the district to let us know. That would have um, quarantined like two classrooms, we figured. Coming back, I've got, I think it's five or six staff right now who are quarantining or are positive or in the process of getting tested because they're ill. So the reason I share that with you is I think it's important to know that we continue to track. And yes, I feel like we did the right thing taking this time and not um, bringing everybody back because I really our goal is to try to get through a much of this. Hopefully it'll it'll work its way through the district and by then we'll have vaccines and some different uh, things in place for everybody. So I just want you to know, Craig, that we do continue and, and uh, board members, we do continue to track that. Uh, we will have an action item at the next, uh, at this board meeting. I have listed out the staff members that were not eligible for the hazard pay due to the way they were coded. So for example, like any administrator like Tim, Tyler, um, Tracy, myself, Joe, um, any of them, we were not, we did not qualify for hazard pay. Uh, Rachel and Tara, um, instructional coaches, they didn't qualify. Jody Wade, my preschool teacher. So um, I put these together. These are all people that worked every day when we were shut down in March. So I um, want you to consider if you, you had asked me to get that list together for you, so that would be like based on the $500 for teachers or 250 for support staff. And I would designate that on there for whatever they would be, they would qualify due to their position. Um, 
All of the other staff has been turned in that had to fill out the appropriate paperwork. All of that has been turned into the state. The state is going through those right now. Those are scheduled to be released, I think, pay in February. So just, you know, and that is on that hazard pay. Is there any questions on the hazard pay and what you guys want to discuss with that? Okay, if you have questions, let me know. Um, the other topic of discussion is uh, the emergency uh, family leave act that we had for those staff that might have had to be quarantined or um, had COVID that ended on December 31st. So right now, it's floating out and Tracy can jump in and help me on this. But right now uh, we did a lot of looking at what other school districts are doing. A number of them are saying it ended December 31st. We should probably end it December 31st because we don't wanna get into the, well, maybe you had four days left or you we don't really think you really had it or you know, trying to, measure who who could get those days or not. I believe that um, the legislature is going to extend that, but I think for right now, and if they do extend it and a, and a staff member does use sick days, we could always put those sick days back in. I think Tracy, I'm right in saying that if I'm not, correct me. But uh, my, my thought is that it ended on the 31st. We stick with the federal guidelines. I just think it gets really muddy if we don't. I, I don't know. I'm opening it up for a conversation because if you guys want to extend it, we're going to have to probably have a board action on that. Is there any concern with what you guys have in regards to that? Or are you okay with just following the federal guidelines? Okay, I see a lot of heads shaking yes. Okay. If not, give me a call and, and we can go through it. But um, my gut is, as we stick with the way the feds are doing it right now and not get into trying to decide who, who would be eligible and who not. Okay, that's it for under personnel, Mr. Artis. Under student affairs, we really covered all of that, Brian. Um, the only thing that I will tell you guys is at the very bottom is Camp Rotary. Camp Rotary has, um, has decided that they will not be opening their facility for kids this year. That was a policy that they put in place. Tim and I had talked about this a little bit and Tim had talked to uh, Kevin Kent, our outdoor educator, um, head of that. And we were trying to come up with some different options. But what we're gonna do is probably just do two, two groups next year then. So you, we would take the sixth graders and then do it for seventh grade. So maybe do the seventh graders in December, the sixth graders um, at their regular scheduled time. I'm gonna end up doing the same thing with the swim, the swim program with the fourth graders is I'm gonna not do it this year. And then next year we'll do the fourth grade and the fifth grade. I think that that would be appropriate. The kids aren't missing it. We just have to just pick it up and, and move it. So. That is not something we decided to do with Camp Rory. I just want you know, they, they closed their facility for any outdoor programming. Any, any questions on that? No, thanks, Kim. Okay. Are we, um, are we, do we know for sure that Camp Rotary is gonna accommodate us for two separate events? Um, Tim, are you there? Yeah, we actually have secured, uh, we have on the books three different weeks for right now just to choose from. Uh, okay. That we ask them to hold. They're very accommodating right now as most camps are because they, they're they they're losing a lot right now. Uh, so yeah, they, they're, they're definitely good with that. Okay, just curious, thank you. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep you posted on that then. Um, all right, I'm gonna just jump up to operations. Um, we'll have some sinking fund pay apps. They're on the back side, guys, of your uh, rubric there that you can take a look at. Um, we've got Cornerstone Architects, John Martin, I did release some funds uh, for partial pay for his work. I will tell you that he's doing a great job. 
uh, framing in the, all the new windows that we put in. We did get all the windows in. That was <laughs> that was quite a project because um, we had some windows that were broken, they had to be replaced. We do have a few pieces of hardware that they have to fix. And I talked to the guys this week because they were in putting them in and Joe has talked to them too. And those pieces are on order, so that's coming. So they look really nice. I'm, I'm really pleased with those. We have ordered uh, security blinds for all the new windows down in middle school and high school. So that'll be really nice. So basically, all we're gonna have left guys is the painting on the exterior of the building that we can get done because the brickwork's been done on the exterior. Uh, Davenport got that done. Um, so yeah, so that's good Good stuff. Our our, our uh, pay apps are really down compared to what they used to be. So that's good. Um, I just, uh, just FYI, I, I don't know if I told you this already or not, but emergency management contacted to use our gym lobby for vaccination, like if we need to do a big clinic. And I said, absolutely, let us know. I mean, that's what we designed that facility for is to help, you know, use it for the community. So um, I already let Linda Schaefer know that, yes, we would be available to do that. Um, uh, I, I put in a copy of our consumer energy rebate, just FYI, so you know we got money back on that project. And that those monies I've had directed Tracy to put right back into the sinking fund, so it's those monies coming back into the to the district. Any questions on operations? Anybody, Joe? You got any questions? Sounds good to me. Okay. Okay, under finance, um, really the good news, I mean, I almost wept with relief <laughs> that uh, the feds passed um, additional monies. So we're looking at four times the amount I, we received in the, in the fall. So we're looking at about a million dollars in federal relief for coronavirus. So I cannot tell you how, how relieved I am. So though I don't know what those what they're going to allow us to spend it. That that's the other side. And how long? I'm hoping they're going to give us a year, because if they only give me six months to spend a million dollars, that that gets kind of that gets very difficult. But we'll be able to get additional computers in with these monies. I'll be able to cover some of the costs of the hotspots that we've had, st staffing. And if I can use this for a year, it will really help us over that bubble. You know, when I showed. We talked about that. I, th I think I showed you guys last month, you know, when we redid the budget amendment, you can see how we dropped off, used all of our, you know, we're going to be out selling wood on the corner here to keep the district afloat if we don't come up with some funds. So this, this is a real blessing. So I'm very pleased about that. So we'll just wait to see what the, we'll see what the government says, how we can spend it. So, all right, any questions, Tam, on finance? Okay, policy, we have a number of things and it's pretty much the basic guys um, that we'll approve um, next week. Uh, the organizational meeting, agenda notes, we'll have the board meeting schedule, committee meeting schedule and rotation. We'll have officer elections and the committee chairs. So if you want to jockey for, you don't want student affairs, uh, Mr. Kunkel, and you'd rather do finance, you and Tamara can fight over that. You know, you guys can decide if you want. <laughs> I know Mr. Kunkel really wants finance probably, right? No, I'm fine. <laughs> okay. So anyway, you can express I your I don't like opinion. pain. <laughs> you guys can express your opinion, opinions to President Redmond. <laughs> what what <laughs> thing you want to keep doing or if you want to stay where you're at. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we will also have uh, Dale Rainier and Dale's on tonight. We will do, be doing the board of the board oath of office at the meeting will actually do that virtually. Uh, Dale, I'll probably run you through that ahead of time so you know what you have to do. And then Dale will have to come in the next morning and sign that oath and it'll have to be certified in our office and we can take care of that. So Dale, I will uh, talk to you prior to the board meeting so you know, raise your right hand, what you'll have to do. Um, I believe I run the first part of the meeting and until you guys have elect a president and then we'll we'll run like we have in the past so uh, the other piece is did you guys you you should have had a chance to look over all of the um the 
policies and things that Katie Bice sent out last time for our health and wellness center. She is going to be on at the board meeting if you have any additional questions, but we're going to need to approve those policies, okay? Um, I didn't hear from anybody, so I, I assumed that everybody was good with everything and how, I mean, this is a pretty standard operating procedure for every district that has this in the state of Michigan. So they're, they're running those um, absolutely the same. Does anybody have any questions on the health and wellness center or, cause I could get those questions answered for you if you need me to ahead of time. Okay. All right. Well, if you think of anything, otherwise we will be approving those um, at that meeting in um, next week. Uh, under miscellaneous, I will let you know that Robert Huber has retired. Our longtime attorney has retired. And um, I have talked to Troon and they are, um, obviously we can choose whatever attorney we, we would so like, but they've got an attorney that they want uh, me to talk to. He's out of the Grand Rapids area, been there a while. Um, I've not spoken with him yet. I spoke to one of the um, one of the lead attorneys at Troon just before Christmas break. And so um, we'll have that conversation. And I know a number of the attorneys, so we can get answers for about anything we need, as you guys already know. So if you have any concerns on the attorney um, issue with Troon, let me know. Okay. All right. Um, I believe that is that is everything I have on the list. Is there any other questions for the good of the group that I can answer? Okay, uh, Mr. Redman, I'm going to return it uh, back to you. And I will ask again if there's any comments from the public. 